Southwest Power Pool, serving as the moderator of this webinar on behalf of eSIG. I've had the pleasure of serving on the Board of Directors of eSIG for a number of years now. I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series and give you a little bit of background on eSIG. For those of you not familiar with eSIG, we are a membership-based nonprofit organization providing our members with objective information and resources for renewable energy and energy systems integration decisions. We also provide peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities, information and knowledge sharing, and professional educational experiences. <clears throat> our most recent activity was our annual forecasting and markets workshop in Denver earlier this month. And our next activity will be the fall technical workshop the last week of October in Charlotte. These workshops deal with the full range of issues associated with integrating wind and solar into electric, gas, and thermal systems. They also deal with the coupling to energy consuming infrastructures, especially electric transportation, buildings and industry. Information is available on the upcoming workshop and everyone is invited to attend. ESIG is a very unique organization, and I don't think you'll find anything quite like it anywhere else in the world. If you're new to ESIG, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You can find us at www.esig.energy, as well as on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay, just a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. So please use the question and answer box on the lower right side of your screen to submit questions. And we will save about 10 minutes or so at the end for Q&A. We plan to wrap it up at the top of the hour and an email with a link will be provided once the presentation and audio file have been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, so don't be afraid to use the Q&A box. <laughs> okay, so today's webinar is on the topic of transmission topology optimization, a software solution for improving congestion management. This topic is receiving increased attention these days, but a lot of questions still remain about just how quickly it's going to happen. At the end of the webinar today, my hope is that everyone will be a little better informed and have a little better sense of the opportunity before us with topology optimization on transmission systems. <clears throat> the webinar today will feature two people that I've known for a long time, Pablo Ruiz from Brattle and Jay Casperi from SPP. Pablo is a senior consultant at the Brattle Group, associate research professor at Boston University and co-founder of NewGrid, a software startup providing topology optimization solutions. Jay, a colleague of mine at SPP, has more than 37 years of experience in transmission planning and electric and gas resource planning, and has been instrumental in developing effective transmission expansion plans for SPP and neighboring utilities. I feel very fortunate to have these two presenters here with us today. Pablo and Jay are both active participants in eSIG events, and I'm looking forward to what they have to say. This webinar will review an assessment of the effectiveness of topology optimization to mitigate congested constraints in Southwest Power Pool operations and planning applications under complex and extreme congestion conditions. The assessment found reconfigurations can relieve flow by over 20% on average across the congested constraints analyzed, many times fully mitigating congestion without needing a redispatch. Experience in using topology optimization in real-time operations and operation support will be discussed. Okay, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Pablo, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Bruce, uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you for in, in presenting. Uh, thank you for uh, for all of the attendees as well. And we uh, both Jay and I, uh, looking forward to your to your reactions and questions um, at the end of the 
of the presentation. <clears throat> um, as Bruce was was uh, providing a summary of the of the presentation, uh, we will will first start with providing some background or, uh, information on the technology, inclusive of uh, illustrative examples and applications. <clears throat> we will then uh, discuss the results of, of a study performed uh, last year with SPP operations, uh, looking at determining the impacts of applying topology optimization to, uh, to support decision-making operations. Um, I will then turn it over to Jay, who will discuss the results of a pilot study uh, that uh, was done after the conclusion of the, of the uh, sorry, a pilot after the conclusion of the study, and then we'll discuss uh, planning applications and we'll finish with some thoughts on on uh, on deployment of the technology and, and, and potential next steps. So in terms of background, um, as uh, most of you are probably uh, well aware, the, the, the traditional approach to manage flows and, and manage congestion on, on transmission systems involves a redispatch, <clears throat> changing the, the, the uh, profile, collection profile of, of different resources, uh, decreasing production upstream of congestion and increasing production downstream of congestion. That, that change in, in production patterns or, or that redispatch involves an increase in cost and sometimes can, can uh, lead to uh, curtailment of uh, renewable resources in, in, um, as well as um, in the cases of, of the unavailability of, of such uh, redispatch solutions, uh, it, it, it may lead to overloads, so, which could be a, a reliability concern. So in this uh, <clears throat> slide uh, number two that, that you're seeing on the screen, <clears throat> we show one example from SPP real time uh, from the SPP real time markets um, just over a year ago in uh, in March of 2018. In this particular case, the or at this partic particular time, the wind penetration level across the SPP footprint was 38%. Uh, so so. Uh, Quite high, not, not not nearly as high as, as the as this year's records, uh, but but pretty significant nonetheless. Um, there were three constraints binding, and they are shown by by the color gradients. The, the, these colors, by the way, show uh, different uh, real time prices, where cooler colors show uh, low prices. The purple areas show prices below minus ten dollars per, per minute hour, and warmer colors indicate higher prices. <clears throat> So the, uh, we see that one constraint, uh, the, the one shown in the in the center in the, in the Kansas area of the of the SVP footprint, was le leading to 285 megawatts of wind curtailments, and sending prices to be very negative. Um, and that in that particular area, prices were uh, about uh, minus 30 dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, the other two, uh, one of them uh, in in the in the south. Um, east part of the footprint was being overloaded. That, that means there were no there were no um, generation downstream of the constraint to be able to increase and, and limit the flow. Um, <clears throat> so that that's the 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 uh, the current practice as a, uh, or the traditional practice that involves a resource redispatch. What uh, topology optimization does is, is it complements uh, the traditional approach. By looking for, by searching for reconfigurations of the transmission system, uh, these are implemented by opening or closing circuit breakers. And the goal of these reconfigurations is to to divert flow, to root flow around the very few congested elements that happen at any point in time. So going back to the example in this slide, <clears throat> the historical case we see on the left-hand side with three binding constraints. Um, after feeding the data on, on a topology optimization software package, the result uh, indicates what reconfigurations to, to implement in this particular case was one, one switching operation per uh, constraint. And as a result, uh, enough relief was provided in, in two of them, the most expensive ones, that, that uh, full, release, full relief was achieved uh, with, without any wind curtailments or overloads. And, uh, there was one one remaining congested element in the southwest piece of the of the footprint. <clears throat> um, we would illustrate how these reconfigurations work in, with, with a very simple example in the next two slides. This is a seven bus uh, test system where the 
the unit on bus two, this is on the center left part of the of the chart, is the is the most economic, but it cannot be fully utilized due to congestion on the line going uh, directly to the right of it. <clears throat> And then, uh, so going from two to five, and then the one going up from five to four. So the next slide shows on the left-hand side that same chart that we saw before, but now showing um, the, the location on prices just to illustrate where congestion is happening and what it's doing. <clears throat> and we see that due to Kirchhoff loss, some of the flow that that leaves a bus to the, 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 uh, the, the least cost uh, unit in the system fully reinforces congestion, both lines from two to five and five to four, and then moves on to feed demand somewhere else, uh, in this case, bus three, even though um, there are alternative paths to, to feed bus, uh, that, that demand at bus three. Um, now, of course, uh, with um, flow, follows uh, Kirchhoff loss and, and, and uh, without any means to control flows, this is what happens. What, what topology optimization does is it, 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 it finds reconfigurations that would, that would force some of the flow that's doing these type of, of um, parallel flows to, to, uh, to, re to reduce the, the effect. So in this particular case, <coughs> um, this path is, is not beneficial. So one way uh, of preventing it is to open the circuit breaker that, that uh, would disconnect the line between four buses four and three. So that effectively pushes all of the, or forces all of the flow to, to that meets uh, demand on bus three to stay on the left-hand side, increases the transfer capacity, uh, reduces congestion, and creates, it creates room for the market to, to re-optimize the dispatch leading to savings and differences in, in prices. So this is, uh, of course, a toy example just to illustrate <clears throat> um, what happens. We'll, we'll, we'll see next uh, the results of, of some uh, on, on simulations on, on SPP systems. Uh, th these reconfigurations work, and, and to the best of our knowledge, they are used by pretty much every system operator and transmission owner uh, across the world. The traditional practice, though, in, in what mostly has been limiting the application is that the reconfigurations have been identified based on, based on staff experience. This could be operators or, or engineers. Um, this is a very time-consuming process, as, as one can, could imagine, um, given the complexity of the systems, especially given the, the number of, of post-contingency constraints um, involved. So the main the main value add of, of the, the topology optimization technology is to do exactly uh, the, the finding or the searching of for reconfigurations to provide options for, for operators and engineers that they could then um, discuss with transmission owners uh, and decide whether to, whether to deploy or not. The identification is very fast uh, to, to provide you with, with a sense in, in systems of the size of, of SPP, it takes between 10 and 20 seconds. Uh, two minutes are, are, are um, very rare. Usually they are on, on, the, on the shorter time frame. Um, of course, the, the reconfigurations meet the reliability criteria uh, as part of the search. The search engine runs continuous analysis and, and checks that any candidate reconfiguration would meet uh, such uh, Contingency analysis uh, constraints. If 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 the answer comes out uh, negative, then the the optimization engine keeps searching, <clears throat> and one could search for solutions of two two flavors: uh, preventive solutions, where the recompression is implemented in the base case or under normal operations to be, um, so that the recompression will be in place um, before any contingency would happen. So that should the contingency happen, the um, the, uh, there would be no violations. The other flavor is corrective solutions. The, these, are, these are solutions to be deployed only if the contingency occurs. And both could be, uh, both of these uh, solutions could be searched for and could be, could be used. So, so that was the background on the, 
on the uh, technology. Now we'll move on to the to the study with with SPP operations. Um, in an, in a nutshell, the what the study uh, consisted of was to of uh, analyzing 20 snapshots of, of SPP real time conditions that SPP staff selected uh, due to the the level of of uh, congestion and complexity of, of that congestion present in those cases. <clears throat> um, a few words on what the cases and the constraints were before we move on to look at the results. Uh, some of these snapshots represented severe or extreme conditions. So uh, two, two highlights, uh, one was the winter load peak record in January of 2017. This, this case represents near emergency conditions um, SPP operations did implement reconfigurations under under this case. <clears throat> there were a number of, of uh, congestion and, and breach constraints. Um, and then the other the other highlight is the one peak record uh, from December 4th of 2017. Um, in this case, the renewal penetration was 58 percent. SPP has since uh, achieved over 70 percent, well over 70 percent of renewal penetration. Uh, that was a record uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, under those conditions, the wind was uh, over 13 gigawatts. <clears throat> um, this is just to highlight that the, on average, we would expect that, that the results would be would be better under normal conditions, since uh, since there would be more room in the system uh, for the reconfigurations to take advantage of. Um, about half of the constraints that we looked at were, were breaching in real time. Um, the, the, uh, the rest of 40% was binding and 10% was just activated. Activated means they are close to binding but not, not at the limit. And there was a range of uh, voltage levels as well as a range of uh, frequency of, of binding. Some of these were, were very frequently binding constraints, some were, some were more rare. So a, a nice selection. Of constraints, <clears throat> in terms of the geographic spread, um, they were they were um, also selected to to uh, to span uh, a fair section of the of the SPP footprint. Not quite all of the footprint, but but a, a pretty pretty large section of it. And this slide also lists <clears throat> the the different uh, constraints that that we we looked at. Um, you will see that uh, the list uh, includes 17 of them rather than 20. A, a, a few constraints, three constraints, we we studied under different conditions. <clears throat> so moving on to the to the results, uh, we we looked at uh, those uh, system snapshots fr from uh, f from uh, from real time. As, as um, archived by the by the EMS, and search for solutions. And the solutions, of course, had to be feasible, uh, meaning meaning both pre and post contingency reliability criteria, um, which then SPP staff validated in the in the EMS in study mode. And uh, whenever possible, we were looking for solutions that that met a number of criteria that uh, SPP staff deemed to be preferred. And these are listed in the slide. The uh, first one is to not not create a new constraint uh, that was loaded uh, over 95%. So meaning the the relief on one constraint should hopefully leave it at least 5% room on any any other constraints that that uh, might um, might become relevant. Um, the actions uh, would prefer to be. Below 345 kV, so, so not reconfiguring at, at 345 uh, kilovolts. Uh, that has an impact in, in terms of the of the performance, of course, since about a quarter of the constraints were at 345 kV, and, and, and usually it's hard to reconfigure uh, at different voltage levels. <clears throat> when um, or it's usually to to have an impact on a 345 kV constraint, let's say by reconfiguring it at, at uh, 138, for example. Um, the, in terms of the amount of load radialized, that, that is a constraint uh, that is monitored uh, specifically. The, the criteria here was to not, not put on a radial condition uh, more than 30 megawatts of load that were not before the reconfiguration on a radial condition. And final, was, final uh, criteria was to provide at least 10% relief. So what we found uh, when applying all of these was that for, 
for all of the 20 selected um, constraints, there was at least one solution for 70% of those. Uh, the solutions met the preferred criteria. 25% um, <coughs> um, at least one of the, or, or for the remaining 30%, at least one of the criteria of, of, of the preferred criteria were not met. Uh, most of them were due to the 345 kV um, limitation. And the last one, the 5%, was due to a loading of, of another, another um, constraint. <clears throat> uh, what we found was that with, with the preferred uh, solutions provide a relief of, on average, 26%. Some provide a lot more, some provide less. And uh, when we expand the, the space to feasible solutions, not necessarily meeting the preferred criteria, the impacts uh, are, of course, uh, increased to, in this case, uh, over 31% on average. <clears throat> so that was the impact on average in terms of, of flow relief. The, the next uh, couple of slides are going to look at um, extrapolations on, on what we expect the impacts would be on an annual basis in terms of both reliability impacts and impacts in the real-time market. So we'll start with the reliability one, where we looked at uh, the frequency of constraints that are breached in real-time. Um, in in, in uh, real-time operations, conditions always differ from, from day ahead plans. And, and furthermore, the, the operators have limited means to manage those differences. In, in fact, they, they have limited means to manage con constraints in real time in general. Um, so as a result, uh, the, the, these uh, violations are, are, are not infrequent. In, in 2017, the frequency of breach of intervals that had at least one breach constraint was 34%. <clears throat> Based on, on the analysis of the, of the 20 cases, assuming, of course, that those are representative, we would estimate that the that would be that could be reduced by by about 75 percent to get to 8 percent of such uh, intervals with breach, breach constraints. So this is an estimate of of benefits from a reliability point of view. So moving on to to uh, market or estim estimated market impacts. In this case, uh, up until up until this slide. Um, effect, uh, except for perhaps for for the for the first example, um, we assume that the historical dispatch was not changed after re after the reconfiguration. So we were looking when we were looking at uh, flow relief, we were assuming a fixed dispatch, applying the reconfiguration and seeing what the change in flows would be. Now, of course, once you once you do that, um, you create additional room in the transmission system that that the market uh, clearing engine could, uh, could use to redispatch generation and provide uh, additional market savings. So we, we studied those in detail, looking at four specific cases out of the, out of the 20. And these, these particular four constraints that are listed in this slide were among the, the most frequently binding constraints at the time in, 20, in the 2017, 2018 um, period. Some of these are still uh, highly binding and very relevant. Um, so to conduct this study, we, we run two real-time market simulations for these cases, one assuming the historical topology. Of course, we benchmarked those uh, and, uh, and started using um, or employ the real-time bits in, and, um, and, of course, historical, historical uh, transmission system information to provide, uh, to conduct the simulation. So that was the base case, and then we compare that against uh, the, the same real-time market simulation with the reconfigurations in place. <clears throat> um, to be able to to extrapolate, we uh, we looked at relative savings, uh, production cost savings or market cost savings relative to the, to the congestion rent. On, the, on each of these four selected constraints. And what we found was that with the relief provided by the reconfigurations, the, the market cost savings were reduced by anywhere between two and 5% of the initial congestion rent on the same constraint. And on average, we'll say that's, that's uh, 3%. Um, 
<clears throat> so using using um, these results to extrapolate in, in assuming uh, the 75 percent factor from from previous slides um, we estimate that the the, the total real-time annual market savings um, are somewhere between 20 and 40 million or or to be more precise 18 and 44 million uh, this is based on on the real-time market uh, congestion rent <clears throat> So uh, not not non-trivial impact, uh, especially considering that these are the uh, the analogous to production cost savings. These are these are not these are not uh, congestion rent savings, but but uh, very much production cost savings. So with with that, I'm going to turn over the the uh, presentation to Jay, who is going to discuss not the results of a study, but rather the results of of, a, of an on-site pilot deployment at SVP. Thank you, Pablo. This is Jay Casperi, and thanks, Bruce, for setting this up. Uh, I appreciate your uh, participation in this webinar, and I hope we have some really good questions and answers at the end of this uh, the formal presentation. Um, I, um, I personally am a really big fan of topology control for, for more than just mitigation. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, to operate the grid in a way that maximizes its value and flexibility. <clears throat> um, reconfiguration can provide actually a, a stronger scenario than than you might expect, but maybe you don't even know about that case because you don't think about it. And uh, these tools are a great way to actually identify potential reconfigurations and evaluate them and, and consider deployment of them in, in operations. Um, SPP really appreciates um, the work by Pablo and the others at uh, New Grid to demonstrate the, the value and the merits of topology control and, and optimization. Um, Catherine Dial, who was mentioned on, I think, on slide seven on a footnote, um, is in our operations support, and uh, she deserves a lot of credit for the following slides and was the lead staff in this actual pilot assessment at SPP. Um, I'm going to move forward, and hopefully the slides will go with me. Um, uh, go backwards. Let's go forward. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you a, a really quick overview of, of the pilot project that we did here at Southwest Power Pool. It was conducted by our operations staff, and it it, it used the, the new grid router tool um, in the latter half of 2018. Um, this was a, a reliability-focused assessment. Um, one of the key principles at Southwest Power Pool are that reliability and economics are inseparable. And I think we all uh, appreciate that, um, just understanding how the grid operates. Um, but this is uh, focused on operations analysis and planning. And we were looking for preferred solutions. And like Pablo mentioned in terms of the criteria, um, we are looking for at least a 5% uh, loading reduction for N-1 using the topology reconfiguration. We had criteria that we did not want to uh, radialize more than 30 megawatts of load. Um, with the, the solution. And we were trying to limit the, the number of switching solutions um, for obvious reasons. Um, we we want to make this as simple as possible and effective as possible and something that's actually practical that the operators are comfortable with uh, with implementing um, over time. But again, this was just a test. As, as Pablo mentioned before, we didn't want to switch our 345 and 500 kV backbone systems. Um, so we focus mostly on reconfiguring the uh, the underlying 115, 138 system, as you're going to see. Um, one of the key criteria also was that after we did reconfigure the system, we didn't want um, any resulting loading on on facilities to be over 95% post contingency for the next potential outage. Um, as Pablo mentioned, we looked at you know over 100 flow gates. Um, that were congested uh, in real-time operations. Um, I, I want to clarify that, uh, you know, we, we identified reconfigurations to reduce the market congestion um, after the fact, and these were not really implemented in real time, but we used real data to, to actually identify the value of the tool and the applications of the tool. Um, for those 100 flow gates, we actually found 55 uh, preferred solutions, which is great, I think, uh, that more than half of the uh, the cases, um, we found better configurations that actually worked. Um, some of the reconfigurations that we did identify using router 
have been used in real-time operations. We actually ended up creating an operating guide in, in southern Oklahoma to help deal with some uh, 138 kV um, loading issues um, near Ardmore, Oklahoma, and in a relatively weak part of our system, as you'll see, because we don't have a lot of resources on the south and the east side of, of these constraints to actually help in terms of redispatch. So we actually did create an operating guide that did reconfigure. Uh, we also were able to uh, to validate the mitigation of the Dardanelle to Clarksville for an outage of the A and O to Fort Smith permanent flow gate, as you'll see. Um, the the key, I think, to to getting buy into this, and, and it's going to take some time, and, and we're, we're we've got a really good path forward, I think, is is to get the transmission operators comfortable with the uh, reliability coordinator's uh, recommendations on reconfiguration. And uh, I think this study has helped to demonstrate that to a large extent, and hopefully will help us move forward. This this graphic um, basically shows you the, the three examples I'm going to walk through and where they are physically on our system. Um, SVP covers uh, 14 states, and uh, the majority of the wind in SVP is in the western plains, which are in uh, the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles in western Kansas primarily. As you can see on this map, the um, topology optimization examples are in uh, southeast Kansas as well as southeast Oklahoma and northwest Arkansas on the eastern side of our system. Um, SVP is, right now I think we have about 22 and a half gigawatts of wind on our wires, um, about 800 to 1,000 megawatts of that are, are units that are actually dynamically scheduled um, to loads and, and markets east. Um, or, or have firm transmission service to move that power off our off our BA to, to markets east. And uh, so right now we have about 21 and a half gigawatts of wind on our wires that is sinking to our BA. And uh, as you might expect, uh, the constraints on our system are in the eastern part of our system, and mostly it's west to east flows um, driven during high wind conditions, um, given the, the load centers on our system are on the eastern part of SPP down in Shreveport or Texarkana or over toward Fort Smith um, in uh, Arkansas or Springfield, Missouri, um, you know, Kansas City area up into Omaha and, and into uh, Sioux City and places like that in the Dakotas, Sioux Falls. Um, but this shows the, the examples I'm going to walk through and we'll, we'll do a little deeper dive here in a minute on each of those. Um, so for the first one, I really want to talk about the, the real-time uh, solution example, um, and then this is a summer uh, case in August of uh, 2018. We were seeing some significant uh, south to north flows on our system, and uh, we identified that this Dardanelle to Clarksville um, monitored facility was a constraint uh, for an outage of the A and O to Fort Smith 500 kV line, which is a permanent flow gate. Um, this constraint was really challenging to control. Um, due to significant external parallel flow, flows that were on our system um, between us and MISO. And as you'll see on the next diagram, you can see why this might be an issue. Uh, we have significant, you know, nuclear generation that is not uh, easily redispatched and hydro units that are wanting to be dispatched because this is peak load conditions under which we were seeing these heavy transfers from the south to the north on our system. Um, during this actual operations, our real-time staff did request that operations support uh, perform a topology control assessment to look at this constraint. Um, the ops staff were, were able to quickly identify the pre-contingency mitigation plan, which reduced the constraint flow by over 20 percent and eliminated the post-contingent uh, overload that had been identified um, in our real-time contingency analysis. So that's a great example. I want to show you a picture of this, and it'll help you to understand why. <clears throat> One thing you'll notice is that the, the dark line um, that kind of goes from the, the lower left corner to the middle uh, right part of this graph, that, that actually is the seam between the SPP system to the north and the MISO system to the south and Intergy system. Um, but you can see on this map that uh, we've got a significant 161 kV network in the Arkansas River Valley that's being fed by uh, hydro plants in the River Valley at Dardanelle and, and Ozark and a few others, as well as the Arkansas Nuclear One nuclear plant 
um, which is just outside of Russellville. Um, the the A and O has uh, three 500 kV uh, outlet lines, two heading east toward Little Rock, and one heading west to Fort Smith. <clears throat> the outage of the the element heading west to Fort Smith, the 500 kV line, would um, would overload the uh, Dardanelle to Clarksville element and uh, create some constraints. Um, we, we this is a classic seams issue where we have no or very little little limited flexibility with the hydro and the nuclear units um, that are located in the Arkansas River Valley. Um, the the post-contingency curtailment of the nuke is not viable as one would expect, um, but the analysis identified that uh, we could open up the Clarksville to Little Spider Creek uh, 161 kV line, which increased the impedance um, to the west um, from Clarksville and lowered the flow for the, the Russellville to Clarksville. Um, line. So th that was a very effective, the Dardanelle or Russellville area, um, I'm using those terms interchangeably, I apologize, but the Dardanelle to Clarksville line um, loading did get reduced by more than 20 percent by opening up the Clarksville to Little Spadder Creek uh, line, didn't um, isolate a lot of load and create issues, um, but the, the tool was actually used to help validate um, the operating guide that has been used by SVP for, for a long time and uh, was really needed during these hot summer peak conditions in 2018 and August. Um, so that's one application. I want to go on to a couple more too. Um, one of the things we've used the router tool for also, we found it useful as a means to ensure that existing mitigation plans are, are effective and efficient. And uh, what I want to show you here on this example, it's in southeast Kansas, is um, that we used um, use router to, to verify and validate that existing plans um, were effective. So the constraint, as you'll see on the next graph when I get there, is a, a, a very old uh, 138 kV line in, in south central Kansas. Um, again, it's for an outage of the over the, the 345 kV backbone facilities in parallel with them. Um, the mitigation we had identified before was to open the median to uh, Butler 138 kV line and router quickly helped us validate that this was a, a good solution verified that this plan did work. I can show a better picture on this on the next slide I think. <clears throat> One thing you notice is um, this is in southeast Kansas. You, you don't see the nuclear plant on this case but uh, if you go west of the, the Latham bus where the Elk River wind farm is or the Caney River wind farm on that one, that 345 KB line that heads over to Neosha in Kansas. If you go west of there, you'll hit the Wolf Creek uh, nuclear plant um, in southeast Kansas. So we've got the nuke and we got the wind farms locally on that line as well as all the wind that's west of here, <coughs> um, west of Wichita, which is one of our more heavily integrated uh, 345 KV nodes where significant wind is is, is trying to get to from western Kansas and, and Oklahoma and Texas um, as a result of our uh, priority projects and um, um, a balanced portfolio we built significant transmission in western SPP that helped accommodate all this wind to get onto our wires and make our grid more reliable and efficient. Um, but this, this line from Midian to Altoona was built you know over 75 years ago um, in the interim they did it, extend that you know add a a substation at Butler. So Butler to Altoona is the constraint and uh, it's not surprising given all of the wind that's in western SPP that's trying to get to the load centers within SPP as well as to markets east. Um, so that's that scenario where the router was used to help uh, validate that we, if we open the, the Butler to Midian line it would help to uh, provide a, a more uh, robust configuration and uh, avoid congestion on our system. One of the last scenarios I'd like to talk to you about before I get into some planning issues is uh, congestion that we've actually experienced um, during high wind penetration intervals. And uh, Pablo did mention some of our uh, statistics back from, uh, I guess, you know, 16, 18 months ago when we were having wind penetration peaks and, uh, and maximum wind outputs. Uh, since that time, um, we, we've exceeded those peaks, and uh, I think uh, we've actually forecasted greater than 70% uh, wind penetration cases um, in SPP. 
um, although we we have never really reached them. We've we've come very close um, back uh, in April, I think, um, early morning of April 27th, which was a, a Friday. We we hit a, a peak wind penetration within our balancing authority of, of over 67 percent. Um, at the time, we were actually curtailing some wind because of uh, constraints and limitations on our system. And also, uh, we actually have exceeded the, the maximum simultaneous wind penetration on our system um, last month, even with over 16.5 gigawatts of wind uh, being injected on our wires and sinking to our BA. Um, but um, so we've got significant wind on our system, and uh, and it, it um, we're, we're getting better and better at forecasting and at managing it and taking advantage of of that cheap, clean, renewable resource on our system. Um, so this is one of the cases where we actually used router again to, to look at uh, our system during uh, heavy transfers of wind generation for for high wind and low load conditions. Um, our load, lowest load on SVP system lately has been about 21 gigawatts of load, which is uh, which is less than the, the nameplate connected wind that's sinking to our BA today. Um, but our system does see significant transfers from the west to east across SPP, and you'll see in, in this example um, where we, we see these same issues in uh, in southeast uh, Oklahoma. And um, But uh, we, we've seen constraints that were exposed to system transfers and located far away from generation where it's really hard to control. Uh, we, we don't have uh, many options, really, in terms of Redispatching generation due to low low shift factors to effectively redispatch resources. So in this example, we're going to show a constraint on a 138 kV system between OG&E and Southwestern Power Administration, as well as um, AEP system in South Central and Southeast Oklahoma. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide um, for this Stonewall to Tupelo 138 kV line for a loss of the the Pittsburgh to, to Valiant 345 KV line. Uh, router helped identify the the uh, the merits of opening up the Civet to Stratford 138 KV line to provide 24% relief, and we ended up with a solution with less than 10 megawatts of, of radialized load. Um, topology optimization made it possible to, to quickly find a solution while minimizing the amount of load that got radialized in this configuration. And this Next slide, I think, will show a pretty good picture of this. Um, just want to make a couple comments about this. Um, obviously, Pittsburgh 345 KV substation is a, a major hub in uh, southeast Oklahoma. The Kiowa generator that's actually shown there and interconnected at the Pittsburgh substation is, is actually an open open tie to Southwest Power Pool. The Tenasca built the Kaimichi or Kiowa. Um, combined cycle plant um, 15, 18 years ago, and uh, that that is a resource into the ERCOT market near uh, Paris, Texas, on that 345 kV line that heads south from Kiowa um, in, across Oklahoma and into Texas. So even though that, that red line that's heading south in the center of that page is shown on this map, it's not electrically connected to Southwest Power Pool. So I just want to raise awareness about that. But what this does show is for an outage of the, the Pittsburgh to Valiant 345 kV line, that contingent element, we see significant overloads. And and and, and it's on the, the old uh, 138 kV system. And it, as you note, you see different colors here. The color in the leftern part of this graph, left part is uh, OG&E territory. That line area around Tupelo heading north-south is actually uh, southwestern uh, power administration's uh, line that heads out of the uh, Texoma area um, and, and heads north and ties into the the uh, other dams in eastern Oklahoma. Um, and the portion of the area on the majority on the right side of this this map is uh, is AEP's uh, Public Service Oklahoma territory. One of the things we see on our system, as most people will find, is that most of the constraints are on the seams between the systems and not necessarily as, as well coordinated as possible, but we're working to improve all that. Um, but this this did show how we could relieve loading on this um, Tupelo line by opening up 
um, the 138 kV system several buses west of there in in OG&E system. So that that's one of the challenges too with uh, topology um, optimization is reconfiguring the system and, and coordinating all that with your neighbors. It, Southwestern Public Service or Southwestern Power Administration may not even have considered that an option since they were looking at the local loading at, at the Tupelo substations. Um, so with that, I want to move on to to uh, one other study we did, and then we'll wrap this up with some Q&A. We have found that router is a very valuable tool, and, uh, and we're going to continue to explore it. But this is summarizing a study we did internally with the help of Pablo and others with our research and development staff, as well as our uh, compliance and advanced studies group, to, to look at um, potential use of router to, to help us uh, mitigate um, load curtailments that are allowed for extreme events, and um, we'll focus on a P6 event and a P7 event, as well as an extreme event under TPL 001-4. Uh, um, so we, we, we were looking at severe contingencies, which involve two sequential overlapping single contingencies for a P6, and P7, things get a little worse because we're looking at a common structure failure generally and P7 is very extreme, where we're, or the extreme events where we're actually looking at loss of a major EHV substation and a totally unrelated other line due to a cyber attack or whatever. Um, so these are very um, extreme scenarios, and loss of load is a, a viable mitigation per the standards, um, non-consequential load loss. Um, but what we did with this application was to, to look at three scenarios um, across our system that are summarized in the next table, and I'll go into that. But the key finding was um, Router was able to identify um, solutions where, um, and it wasn't just the three that are shown on the next slide, but actual many solutions that, that were viable in terms of ways to, to address the overloads uh, with configurations um, and not radializing more than um, too much load in the in the result, as well as minimizing the number of actions by the operators to get there. Um, but th we found this to be a very effective uh, application of the tool and use of it for uh, planning purposes. Um, one of the things you consider, if you're a planner, um, these are pretty extreme events, and and it's easy for them to to just say, oh, we're just going to shed load because the, we, that's allowed per the standard. But it's always good to know. Uh, what you could do in lieu of shedding load to see if one or two switching configurations are viable and effective, and then consider those in case those events do happen, because um, th things do happen on the grid. But we we used um, router to do this, and we were able to avoid non-consequential load loss. Um, and this is a summary of the table. Um, we didn't include any of the details. Um, but uh, these were scenarios, the P6 scenario was in northwest Arkansas, where we had uh, some, some outages that were going to result in a, a solution that was to shed 243 megawatts of load. Um, but Router was able to, to identify two switching actions involving um, 138 kV systems that um, would get rid of the any load loss for that P6 event, um, get the post-contingency loading down to 86% on the critical element, and only have one remaining element that had more than 95% flow on it, but less than 100. Uh, we did end up radializing 65 megawatts of load in that case, um, but it was a much better solution than, than dumping 243 megawatts in the northwest Arkansas load pocket. The P7 event was in northeast Oklahoma and unrelated to the problem in northwest Arkansas. But um, in that case, we were able to to identify um, two switching actions that could avoid 55 megawatts of load loss and not radializing any load. Um, and the, the last but not least one was a very extreme event in uh, central Oklahoma where we lost a big EHV substation and then a, another EHV line on the other side of a load center. and uh, very, very extreme in that with the mitigation identified by the transmission operator was the, the transmission planner was to get rid of 150 megawatts of load, and with uh, one um, topology reconfiguration and 
leaving one element with slightly more than 95% loading, we're able to avoid all of that and not radialize any load. Um, there were other alternatives for each of these. Um, some of them were more complicated. Some of them identified the the merits or to consider opening EHV lines, which we did not want to do. Um, but we did find solutions. And um, I'd like to wrap this up, I think, with one more slide. <clears throat> so we found that topology optimization is very effective um, at, at routing flow around congested and overloaded facilities. Um, we think there are a lot of potential and possible applications of this tool to help us to identify switching solutions um, and ways to address reliability and congestion uh, effectively and efficiently. Um, this tool should be uh, valuable in helping us improving resiliency um, and looking at ways to relieve overloads and, and disconnects and radializing uh, load centers. Um, we, we've also looked at this tool to help mitigate on you know, ice storms and ways to actually heat up lines um, to, to melt the ice and to keep the system intact. Um, and we've, we've validate, we haven't validated that in operations, but it looks like it's a very viable solution and the router was helpful to, to, to give us uh, ideas and, and things to talk about with, uh, with the owners and operators of those assets that actually experienced an ice storm. Um, we've also been able to uh, look at reconfiguring the system as the flow patterns change, and they do change quite a bit, especially with new wind and solar resources coming on our system and a lot of retirements of the old coal-fired units. We've got more and more outages. As the system gets older, um, we have to take outages just to replace and rebuild and upgrade facilities, so um, we, we've got to find ways to, to better manage the, the assets we have left and, and to provide the most efficient service we can. And clearly this will help us with uh, issues in load pockets where it's really difficult to uh, to add and get new transmission and facilities installed quickly. Um, we're looking at using this tool um, in operations and markets potentially. There's a lot of issues with, with uh, you know, financial transmission rights and, and how you would deploy this given day ahead markets and mechanisms that are in place. Um, but we do think we can definitely use router to help us with uh, ops planning and outage coordination, especially plan maintenance outages, um, to try to think about solutions and, and potential uh, reconfigurations as, a, as a, a better solution to dealing with constraints and congestion and curtailments of wind, as an example. We also see it as a tool that can be used in ops and market support to help mitigate system constraints um, and deal with uh, better planning and better operations. Uh, with that, I think I want to open it up to the Q&A, and I appreciate all your questions in advance. All right, well, thanks a bunch, uh, Jay and Pablo. Really appreciate your presentation. And uh, as Jay mentioned, just a reminder that um, we do have a, a Q&A session. If you use the, uh, the box in the bottom right of the WebEx, you'll be able to um, submit some questions. So we do have two questions uh, right now that I'm looking at. First one is uh, from Nicholas. Hello, you can reconfigure transmission to reduce congestion in a single dispatch interval. How many future intervals do you evaluate to avoid frequent switching of circuit breakers? So Jay or Pablo, do you have an answer for that one? Pablo, you want to start? No. Yeah. Yeah, I can start. Uh, so, so a couple of a, a couple of uh, responses on 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 that one. It's a, a great question. Um, in in this particular study, we didn't look at, or, or at least not on our end, uh, but potentially uh, SPP might have looked uh, in, in the pilot. Um, we, we we didn't look in the study at uh, future intervals. Um, what we have found is that uh, number one, when when you provide that level of relief, uh, 20, 26 percent on average, uh, is, is what we found on on the 20 cases. Um, it's it's going to to last for for a while. So it's a, it's a very it's a very significant it's a very significant amount of of um, of relief. And the, the other response is in in other studies in for for other um, in other footprints, uh, we have monitored specifically at the sequence of of intervals and and. Uh, Usually, what we find is that the reconfigurations are are beneficial for a number of of hours. Uh, sometimes these are beneficial for a number of days. Uh, it really depends on the on how uh, variable the flow patterns are. 
but but in general we do find that uh, you don't need to to switch on and off uh, very frequently. Jay, the next one question. Yeah, just to compliment that, it's I appreciate that and. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm concerned about a little bit is aging infrastructure. I, I know that as equipment gets old, I mean, we have very aggressive and robust maintenance plans uh, for circuit breakers, but I, I am concerned that a lot of the breakers installed in the 50s and 60s and 70s are probably getting to their end of their useful life. So one of our objectives was to kind of limit the number of switching operations um, and find viable solutions. So, but uh, appreciate the question. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Lorenzo, what are some other types of reconfigurations you can optimize besides opening a line? So are there other options that the tool looks at? Um, yes, aside from, from opening lines or, or, or in general any any type of branch, you know, transformers, um, you know, series devices or, or optimizing the the bypass or not bypass uh, status of of, um, of reactors or capacitors. Um, so aside aside from those, the 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 search engine looked at uh, substation reconfigurations. In in this particular study, uh, given the specifics of the data we were we were um, uh, we were using, um, those didn't come up. But uh, but the tool in general has the, the capability of of reconfiguring substations, just splitting buses or or, or merging them. Okay. Um, then Alexandra has a question. Will the additional reconfigurations associated with planned outages be published so that we can model the system correctly? This is Jay. Let me start on that. I appreciate the question. I'm a little bit confused by it somewhat. But, uh, you know, we're doing – these are planning studies and, and post, you know, um, event analysis, trying to look at what we could have done, what we should have done, uh, um, what we could have considered, and, and what are the merits of potential reconfigurations using router. Um, I, I think that's a, a question that's got to be addressed going forward as these tools are, are implemented and, and procedures are put into place to, to, uh, to, to share and be as transparent as possible about uh, what the solutions would be. You know, we have operating directives that we use that reconfigure our system, and we do post those, at least in SPP, and they're available by the operators for anybody's use for firm service. And I think that's really important to be as transparent as we can about what the potentials are, but uh, we, we haven't got that far down the path yet. Um, we will at some point, and I'm sure we'll be relying on our stakeholders and our our working groups to help us work through the, the process of what, what information would be provided, when, and to whom. Okay, thanks. And I think we have time just for this last question, then I'll need to wrap it up. So can the tool look also at outage coordination to reposition outages, for instance, if the congestion costs are too high? So I'm reading the question to be, you know, can you do it for, for pricing and not just um, for uh, overloads? Um, Go ahead, Pablo. Yes, yeah, sure. sure. So, so, so in general, the, the the tool can look at any type of of congestion event, uh, regardless of whether it's it's a market uh, congestion constraint or a reliability violation. So, I don't know if that answers the question, Bruce. Okay, well, I think we're about top of the hour, so let me go ahead and wrap it up. First off, you know, again, really appreciate uh, Pablo and Jay. And um, as mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the presentation and audio file have been posted, and we will also be posting the responses to the unanswered questions uh, once they're ready. Uh, so I think uh, at this point we've answered the four that are up there, but if we get any more, we'll certainly answer those. And we do uh, appreciate your engagement and look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on July 25th. The webinar will feature the topic, the impacts of variable renewable energy on the wholesale power prices and the implications for the merchant market value of wind and solar, presented by Ryan Weiser of LBNL. This is a very timely topic today, both domestically and internationally, 
given the rapidly increasing penetration of wind and solar power in wholesale electricity markets. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Further information on all of our webinars and meetings can be found on our website at www.esig.energy under events and in our newsletters and informational emails. So again, Pablo and Jay, I want to thank you for this very timely and informative webinar and thank all of you for your participation. We look forward to seeing you next month with Ryan on the Electricity Markets Impacts webinar or at all the fall technical workshops uh, in Charlotte in October. In the meantime, take care, uh, everyone, and thank you very much.